to admit that entrepreneurship is a really hard word. I actually made free spelling mistakes in that one word that I had to fix last moment. So <laughs> yes, I know how it is. Um, all right, so, so I mentioned today we'll be uh, speaking about effective entrepreneurship. And the whole idea is about how to have the highest social impact you can have with your own startups. I know that many, many people are really interested in startup and entrepreneurships here. Um, and today we'll be talking about how to basically combine the kind of concern for others and social impact with the entrepreneurship and how um, similarly as you know, new startups have really really um, you know, change the space and for profit space, they can also change the space and in the profit and how to do it. So today we'll be talking all about that. Um, so let's start with um, effective. Uh, we'll do very, very quick quiz. Um, so I'll tell you about a case for a pro social program or a charity and you know, very briefly describe it and you can let me know if you think that that program had positive effect, no effect or negative effect. So I'll let, ask you to raise your hand. Um, so let's start with the first one. So um, educational software. So in short, in 2002, US Congress called for very big action in order to evaluate effectiveness of educational technology. Uh, things like to, tools to improve learning or um, to teach algebra or anything like that. Um, so there were about, about, were about 70 submissions, uh, out of which 16 best were selected for, to be evaluated later on by like, rigorous studies. Um, and previously, about 12 out of 16 of those have been nominated or received award for you know, outsized impact uh, by you know, teachers, schools, educational committees. Um, okay, so quickly, you can raise your hands if you think it had positive effect on educational outcomes. Again, like, raise higher. Okay, uh, no effect? Okay, uh, negative effect. Okay, well, it had no effect. None of those. Uh, and that's quite surprising, just because the effects haven't been seen on anything like early reading, reading comprehension, pre-algebra or algebra. Literally zero detected effect. Um, what about preventing juvenile uh, delinquency? So there was a very well-known program, uh, it was called uh, Scared Straight. Basically, it was about discouraging young people from committing crime by uh, taking them to prison and showing how it is, or showing them videos about how it is to be and live in a prison, um, or meeting one-on-one -on -one meetings with, uh, with inmates um, and describing how the lives look like in order to, well, scare them to be straight and behave. Um, so it was quite an intense program. Sometimes it was very uh, you know, aggressive, active. Sometimes it was just passive watching videos. Um, so do you think it reduced the rate that participants committed crime in the future? Uh, positive effect? Okay, good intuitions. Uh, negative effect? Wow, and zero effect. Okay. Yes, in fact, you're totally correct. What, 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 what are we doing here? <laughs> Maybe I can give you a microphone. Um, yeah, it had like a negative effect. It actually increased uh, increased crime, um, and it was proven with with numerous randomized, so the highest highest um, quality of evidence uh, studies. Um, that was the same whether, regardless of the program, um, basically the program is still in use and used very widely and still being recommended and you know being advertised as amazing experience and something that is like very very positive. Well, the effects haven't changed since then. Um, how about the warming? Um, the warming programs generally uh, provide children with medication to clear parasites infections. Uh, this time, what do you think could be the effects of that? Uh, in what areas? Do you, you, can, you can just answer if you have an idea. Mm -hmm. Healthcare. Healthcare, yeah. Any other ideas? Okay, yeah, those are, those are good, good guesses. Um, in fact, the biggest effect of the warming we've seen is on educational outcomes and on poverty reduction. Specifically, many, many high quality studies show that you know, just simple warming pill already clears warm infections. And additionally, there's um, evidence that increased school attendance, increased educational outcomes, and also increased lifetime earnings. And that's maybe the su most surprising claim here in the whole, whole thing. So when they kind of compared it to, uh, for example, having more teachers in schools, especially in like rural areas where there's not that many teachers, or having better educational materials, or better curriculum, none of that had such a strong effect on long-term life, lifetime earning. And we are talking about people living in in uh, poverty um, as the warming hat. Um, and additionally, it's very, very cost effective. So just to treat, in order to treat one person, it's just 50, 50 cents, which is very, very, very little. 
Um, what about microfinance and microcredits? Um, the idea behind that is that sometimes very poor people might need just a little bit in order to you know, cover emergency healthcare needs or in order to start a business. So the idea behind that was what if we just provide uh, with them with small loans with very, very low interest uh, and that might kick them to start a business, therefore helping them long term or, or for example, fix like short term needs that they have. Um, the um, person who came up and studied microfinance had received Nobel Prize, generally had been very, very widely adopted and prized. Um, so what do you think? Did it um, help to reduce poverty? Uh, had positive effect? Uh, no effect? Negative effect. Cool. Yeah, no effect. Um, so evidence from randomized controlled trials in low and middle income countries show that basically microcredits have no effect, didn't lead to any transformative um, changes in income or long-term consumption. Um, basically, again, no effect. What about then giving cash to poor, just like that? Um, just hanging unconditional cash transfers via um, transfer via mobile, mobile phone uh, system. You know, it with the the kind of the cash transfers were relatively small, like it was ongoing. Do you think just hanging out the cash uh, had a positive effect? Uh, no effect and negative effect. Okay, yeah, it had significant positive effect. Um, that was in this in fact one of the best studied development interventions uh, and one of the most uh, reliable way to reduce poverty. Um, so that not only increased consumption in the short term, like especially food or education, uh, but also uh, again some of the worries that people had, it didn't actually increase some of the negative impacts, like for example increasing alcohol consumption or tobacco consumption, as something that people were a bit worried about. Um, there's even evidence that recipients were able to invest this cost transfer into, for example, a business um, with like, high returns and actually that will uh, that increase their uh, earning and consumption later on in life as well. Um, so all of that is to show that, you know, FF, maybe maybe in this crowd, you know, every, 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 everyone seems to know have like pretty good intuitions about those sort of things. But in general, those things are really really hard to just a priori guess or you know would be um, would be a, what would be the difference between a microcredit versus you know uh, a traditional cash transfer that could possibly have those effects. Those are very very similar interventions, and yet the results are drastically different. One of the things is one of the best studied, most effective way to escape poverty. Other one has no effect, um, and that's very quite often that even similar interventions might might have very drastic effects, and it's sometimes very hard to hard to tell. So what about cost effectiveness? Um, so in the charitable evaluation community, uh, cost effectiveness is basically like philanthropic return on investment. Um, how much you know, good can you do per dollar spent? So if I invest you know, a dollar or a thousand dollar into that oppor uh, charitable opportunity, how much good that will actually achieve? Uh, in regardless of whatever metric matter in this context, for example, life saved or uh, CO2 emission reduced or animal welfare um, rights increased. And whatever metric you, you'll choose, this is about like looking at where we can get uh, the most for per dollar of investing in this space. Um, so how much do you think uh, the most cost effective charities differ from the average charity? Do you have a intuition like is it is it roughly similar? Like you know top charities are similar to the median charities, is it like twice or any intuitions? And if you know the answer don't tell. <laughs> Just like a first intuitions. How much? Thirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hundred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, it is. It is about ten times. The top charities are about you know ten times to thirty-five times more effective than the average charity, and it's very closely follow like the um, eighty-twenty Pareto distribution where. Very few interventions um, uh, bring majority of the impact. Um, so if you just randomly had like a bucket of charity ideas and you just picked up one at random, very likely it will have um, small effect, uh, if if any, um, and only a couple of those will will have really outstanding outstanding impact. Uh, so compared to, for example, the worst charity uh, that already will be the top charities like fifteen thousand more effective than the less least least effective one. Um, and this is just within one specific cause area. So if we already assume that um, global health and poverty 
is more cost effective than, I don't know, helping people in the US, um, then even still within that category, that's kind of what we observe. And you can see like here is the cost effectiveness and here is like how many interventions are at that level of cost effectiveness. Um, and this is not only true for global health, this is true for large US social programs, um, education in low and middle income countries, and other global health data databases, public health in rich countries, um, ways to alter meat consumption to reduce animal suffering and you know policies to reduce CO2 emission. Um, and this is the sort of graph that we see whenever we looked into almost any area. So it's very, very common and it's very, very unfortunate. I really would prefer to live in a world where you know, m you know, almost all charities were doing significant social good. But unfortunately we've learned from all of that that this is not the case. And I think that has like very profound implications because it means that people who want to do good or want to do the most good uh, could achieve far more um, with the same time investment or the same you know, money investment um, and they could achieve way more by just paying attention to which are most effective and cost effective options. Um, so that's no additional effort um, required in order to, to have much higher social impact. So that's why uh, today we'll be focusing on on how to select those ideas that could have that outside impact. Um, so I'll start with um, general principle of like problem, solution, leading pathway. Uh, very often when I talk with people who uh, want to start a new organization, um, they often come to me and I say, you know, I have 10, experience, 10 years of experience in that area. Um, what ideas for a startup do you have that I could do utilizing my experience in, in particular domain? Um, and of course, we could come up with some ideas, but uh, if the goal is to have as much impact as we can, a uh, much better approach would be to first look at what are the biggest problems, what are some of the best solutions, and once you narrow down from a list of you know, thousands of possible options to those that look the best from the impact perspective, then you can start thinking, then you can start thinking about you know, your personal fit and your personal expertise. And I think that personal fit is really, really important and getting that idea right and you having the motivation and energy uh, to, to work on it um, is, is gonna be super important. But I feel like if, if the goal is to have the maximal impact, you can choose the area first and then apply your uh, specific personal fit. Um, so just like a couple of examples of like, if someone is interested in FemTech, Maybe like one of the ideas is like that's quite common is like period tracking or like innovation within within that space. Um, but if they, for example, decided instead to go into development products like Cyanopress, which is uh, injectable contraception, uh, which basically is very helpful for people that don't have any health clinics health close to them or just might not be able to like you know repeatedly um, kind of you know sustain use of other contraceptives. This is something that you get once for a really long time. Um, it's very cost effective and, and starting to be scaled up right now in many low income, middle income countries. Um, so if someone is interested in that domain, going with innovation such as Cyanopress, Press, it might have been much higher impact than, for example, some other options. Uh, similar to global health and development, uh, quite common behavioral change communication, like for example, um, campaigns to um, wash hands or campaigns, to, uh, educational campaigns about all, all sorts of topics. Um, that's like, okay, uh, but there are some programs that are much, much more effective, like for example, large scale food fortification, where basically uh, common staple food like flour or rice is being fortified with like key nutrients that we might be getting, no problem with our diet, but, but in many, many other places in the world, people are not getting even the basic, um, basic nutrients. Um, education for countries, books versus the warming, I already mentioned about uh, medical R&D, research and development, um, vaccines, uh, new manufacturing uh, and R&D in the vaccine space, especially in the situation as we've been very recently and still to some extent are um, in, you know, to prevent uh, future pandemics and when they occur to quickly be able to develop country measures is going to be have outsized impact. Then, for example, cancer, cancer research, and I'll explain soon why, because that might be a little bit less um, obvious. Um, me uh, mental health, um, quite common, you know, increased access to psychotherapists, you know, there are definitely, there's definitely treatment gap uh, and not enough psychotherapists, but uh, something that is even more cost effective and scalable is guided self-help. So um, just going through a self-help book, a specific like work, uh, work book design to like treat given condition has very similar effectiveness to in-person therapy and it's just much cheaper and people can do it without any stigma. Um, so if someone were to um, you know, set up a giant project like Amazon of Africa and just like distributed workbooks uh, treating the breath for treatment of depression to all the people that might need it and right now the dog don't have access to it. This, this could be very, very scalable and very, very effective. Um, so any innovation in that space 
uh, could be very beneficial. Um, okay, so those are just like a couple of examples. Um, that's how it might look like within a given cause area. But this is true even across cause areas as well. So again, people might intuitively sometimes think that you know, global health might be in Uganda, might be similar to like global health in UK or Germany, or um, maybe animal welfare is comparable to climate change or it's comparable to elderly care. Um, it's very often that we see causes as equally impactive and impactful. And, and they are, they are, they are important in terms of that particular group of people are receiving help. And I think that's very important and first great step. But similarly as with within the causes, the same trend we see across causes. And when we actually apply cost prioritization framework, we see again that some causes just are much, much more impactful than others. Um, and I'll speak what causes those are. Um, so first of all, the very first principle we'll have is aim at the high priority problem slash cause area. So a high priority problem is big. Basically, the more it's more important, the bigger the, the, the problem, the bigger the success if we manage to solve it. Uh, it's solvable, so which means that for the same amount of resources, time, energy, uh, money, we can make much more bigger pro progress than we otherwise on Earth will be able to, and then neglect it. And that's because of diminishing returns. So the more people work on something or have been working on something, the harder it might be to find the low-hanging fruits. Uh, some domains are just like overly saturated and others just don't have any organizations working on them. So if you're the very first one that aims to address this problem, you might be, uh, and notice that that affects, for example, solvability as well. That might, that might make basically um, make you make progress much, much faster um, and easier than other spaces. And the impact will be larger as well, just because there will be no one else who could step in and solve that problem. Uh, of organizations that are big, um, that are scalable and work in tractable problems, um, in a second, but just very before that, very, very quickly, um, why am, am I talking about that? So, in short, um, as, as you should mentioned, um, I, I am governor of entrepreneurship. We basically approach incubation of new organization in a little bit different way than standard, standard uh, incubator. So, for example, instead of uh, co-founders coming up with their own ideas during the program, uh, we have a very extensive research team that works on finding the highest impact ideas in various cause areas like global health poverty, animal welfare, mental health, um, and we later on find great co-founders who would be interested in starting those organizations. Uh, they participate in two months incubation program, they get all the training they need, all the basics. So we had you know, incubatees who were anything from 18 years old to, I think the oldest one was almost 70 years old. So even people who don't have experience can come in and like will get training in all the skills they need. Um, we help them develop the charity idea, provide seed funding, mentorship, and help them launch and they as independent organizations um, that are doing the most, the most good possible. Uh, so all the examples I'll be using today, uh, from now on, will be examples from the charity staff that we incubated. Uh, so far it's been 18 organizations, so the very first one we incubated was Fortify Health in 2017, and since then we've been incubated about, incubating about five, five charities per year, and our night right now is coming up to increase that first to so double the quality of the charities, and then double the quantity of the charities we're starting in the next three years. All right, so big problems. Uh, so here's a graph of uh, inequality of life years. So far it's been going down steadily. That's absolutely great. Um, burden of disease, also been going down. Uh, child mortality by different income levels, also going down. Um, disease burden in, in, in children, also going down. Those like all are absolutely fantastic trends to see, um, but there's one graph that always pops up when I think about the problems that are not going to the direction, and that's estimated number of farm animals alive at any given point globally. Um, that's the only graph that is going exponentially up. Uh, so at any given point, there are about one billion fish, for example, alive at any given point. That number is really, really, really hard to imagine. But just think of that, right now, in this moment, there is more farmed animals than there have ever been humans on Earth, like ever. Um, and I think that just like illustrates the sc enormous scale of the problem. Um, so, in 2019, uh, we incubated an organization working on fish welfare. Um, similarly, as and all the graphs that I've been showing today, there are some kind of some countries that have higher problem of a uh, higher problem than other countries like China, India. Um, you can see clearly being highlighted here as like countries that produce most most fish in the world. Uh, so we incubated fish welfare initiative. Uh, Tom and Haven started this organization in 2019. They work in India. 
Um, they grow right now to like a group of maybe there are maybe 20 staff right now. So they grew, grew quite quickly and in that space, given that's, that's I gotta say, pretty obscure fish welfare in India. That's not something that people usually think uh, in terms of our start a new startup. And yet they, they have like really, really huge impact, especially for you know people that just came from straight straight from uni and right now are running an organization that by some charity evaluators, like giving what we can, is considered one of the top opportunities in annual welfare space. And that's what they were able to achieve just in a couple of years since starting. Um, they potentially help already, you know, hundreds of thousands of animals and are on the way of like implementing their intervention on scale, uh, which is also super exciting. Um, so that was about big problems. How about uh, solvable? So this is Fortify Health, first organization we incubated. Uh, that was in 2017. They also work in India. They work on meat fortification. So basically, there is a very big problem with malnutrition, uh, specifically anemia, seem to be a very big factor contributing to mother's ill health and children's ill health, uh, and, and, and as a result, uh, child mortality. Um, Huge problem not only in India. Um, when when Brendan and they were starting out, there was no any like large organization working on that problem in the whole India, which is really really huge country. Um, but very quickly they were able to partner with multiple meals and start fortifying flour with with uh, iron, folic acid, B12, all of that to combat anemia at scale. Uh, they plan to uh, reach 4.5 million people by 2025. They so far reached over um, a million and a half, uh, but recently. Uh, receive a big grant to scale up their operation. So I think that um, 4.5 million is very achievable for them. Uh, so that's kind of shows that uh, even though as a new organization, you can make tractions very, very quickly if you're working on an important problem. Um, and in fact, GiveWell, which is the highest rigor charity evaluator in the world, um, is giving them 25% chance in like, being top charity. And that's very, very unique because out of all the hundreds of thousand charities, there is only a couple that have the status of top charity. So if that's if they pass that, that means that they did a pretty good job. So I, I think and they are on that pathway. So that shows that even very large problems are attractable if you have a good way of working on them. Um, and lastly, neglected. And if you think that you know fish is not neglected enough, you, you'll notice that like all of those are both big, uh, both solvable, and both um, and all of those are neglected as well. But here I would like to particularly like to highlight LEAP, uh, Lead Exposure Elimination Project. Basically, um, lead poisoning is a huge global problem. Almost a million children is uh, being are being poisoned with lead. Uh, that's something that people in many countries will find in common household objects, like paint, for example, uh, that is being used to paint households and uh, children in hospitals and kindergartens, and it's just everywhere. Uh, it's not in Israel, it's not in Europe or US, but 111 countries still don't have any regulation against usage of leaded paint, which means that children are being poisoned on like population level. And yet, when we were incubating LEAP uh, in 2020, uh, there was just one organization in the whole world that was working actually regulating that problem. Um, and that's just absolutely insane. Um, and we were, when we were estimating how long it will take them to uh, you know, ban the first country from using leaded paint, we estimated five years. And they made progress in six months after incubation. They already passed regulation in Malawi, the very first country they worked in. And I think part of that is that because the problem was so neglected uh, that there was no actors ever attempting to do that. So there was lots of low-hanging fruits that they were able to, to pick. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I think that if you work in neglected spaces, I think sometimes people might think, oh, they're neglected, no one is working on that, people might not be interested in problems, so it's actually might be harder to make progress. Uh, but I feel if it's neglected, it's sometimes also easier to reach people um, though who you might work with in order to, to change that problem. So for example, in the case, you know, they visited Malawi, their first country they, they've chosen, you know, after a week they were like sending like WhatsApp messages like with Minister of Health. Uh, <laughs> and that sort of thing doesn't happen if a space is like super crowded with like other actors or not necessarily always doing effective work. So if you work in the neglected spaces and you're doing great work, often you might make more traction than less. Um, so yeah, now they're expanding. The, I stopped counting the countries. Last time it was 10, 10 countries. I don't know how much it is now. It's still growing. So I think they were able to grow very, very quickly as well. Yes. You, you, you have the, the statistics of 900,000 people dying from every year. Yeah. Now, is this the statistics that they collected? It was known beforehand? Yeah, yeah it was known before. Um, they have not done like original research in terms of 
you know, counted how many deaths are that, that those kind of database and research and uh, knowledge already exist in like academic research uh, literature. And there have been numerous studies, like secondary and primary studies, that show that's kind of the burden of the problem. So that's not their data. I'll be, if there was their data, I'll be very skeptical. I'm always skeptical of Chinese data. No, the question is like, for example, I wonder if they started entrepreneurship and trying to find a problem that is big scale and neglected. Where do I start looking for Do I go, hey, what problem is killing a million people a year? Or half I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> yes, that's, that's what the majority of the presentation today will be about. So yeah, very, very good question. Happy, happy to answer. Uh, afterwards, I did not include all the tools that I think are super helpful on the presentation, but I'll be very keen to show you afterwards as well, after the presentation, like some specific tools. There are literally databases that you can go to, and it has like beautiful, huge data visualization of like all health problems ever on the planet. To so, like sometimes the details of particular district in particular city, and it maps up all the kind of like you know causes of, of ill health and death. So those sort of tools are great for for that sort of things. Um, okay, so how to choose uh, how to choose an idea for, for a new organization. Um, as you see, we are at the beginning of the road. Um, the most important step is going to be uh, just aim at high priority problem and find the best solutions for it. And that's if I were to use just give one advice or use one heuristic, uh, try to go for a big problem that seems to be tractable, neglected, and do your best in order to find solutions for that. And I. And I think that will get you very far already compared to you know, picking other charity ideas without that kind of in mind. Um, so that would say this is the first and the most important principle. And, and then what about specifics? Um, so the whole process um, is called project concept development. Um, it has multiple stages, uh, but in very short. Um, it's first about identifying project ideas, then evaluating choosing a project based on um, importance, tractability, neglectedness, plus cost framework. Um, making a rough back of envelope estimates of the expected impact, building theory of change, and identifying future considerations, testing those considerations, and choosing a project concept. Right now, those things might sound very nebulous, uh, but I'll get to them in the, uh, in the details. So there's like multi-stage process of like designing a project, from project concept development to planning, design, implementation, monitoring, evaluation, you know, refinement, the standard kind of like startup stuff. Um, but we are right now here in the project concept development. Um, the initial step stage of that. Um, so, why why should you bother with it? Why do you even should bother with project concept development? Um, and I think not everyone need to worry about those sort of things. Not everyone has to go through that process. But if you work on an organization or project that maybe you work in poor knowledge environment or working in context or focus on um, you know information that is easy to obtain, this is something that uh, might be very very helpful for for your project. So, for example, Leap that was relatively straightforward. There is paint, it has lead. If people are exposed to it, they have high blood level, lead blood levels, their IQ and health is, and lifetime becomes are impaired. So, well, let's not use lead and paint. Relatively straightforward. Um, so maybe they didn't have to go through a whole process of project design. Um, however, Fishfall Initiative, working in India, which is usually kind of hard country to work in, plus very neglected species like fish, plus no one ever from animal welfare movement attempted something like that in that context. That was very, plus like there's not as much evidence as there is in like global health and development. Uh, that basically made it much more complex projects and like that sort of process is more helpful for it. Um, okay, so now a question for you. Think for yourself about, I'll, I'll give you, you know, a couple of seconds. Think about an idea for a project. It doesn't have to be right now super great, but you know, you can think from, for about those different cross areas and think about what new project could be started. Um, and that's so it will be helpful when we'll be going through the process, you can think also uh, at each step how that would apply to your idea. So um, I'll give you 30 seconds for to pick one. You can, if you want, you can like turn into a person sitting next to you and discuss the idea as well. Something? You got something? Anyone wants to share very quickly? Yeah?
All right, cool, cool. That looks for helpful to go through the process. So I'll probably ask you additional questions as we go in the process. Yes. It might be a bit of an extreme idea, but I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, in areas where there's not access to mental health, um, basically uh, mass producing uh, Prozac, which is a very cheap medicine and dollar per health benefit is a, a considered very high, as well as uh, maybe an application that you would uh, input your uh, changes in behavior, so if it's not fitting for you, then you don't have to stop. Cool. Yeah, super, super cool idea. Um, It'll be interesting to us to see you work for that. Uh, cool, I look forward to it. Um, all right, so the very first step of project concept development is identifying project ideas, um, and we can go about that systematically as well. So it's all about you know creating actionable plan uh, to create desired outcomes, like reducing uh, consumption of animal products or reducing depression. Um, it's basically you start with understanding the problem, and there are specific tools. We just need assessment for it. Understanding the causal mechanism, why are people not, you know, uh, looking for a plant-based alternative, or why are people uh, not getting treatment for depression and all of that. So understanding the causal mechanism that leads to that problem, uh, and later on creating a theory for how to reduce that problem, so-called theory of change, uh, where you basically have the causal chain of the whole problem, and like you think about like what can I do to like break that chain and like lead to to, to positive outcomes and an impact in the future. Um, it has the core project concept, like a couple of core pieces, population, you know, group of non-humans and human animals, there are recipients of the project, problem, um, what is the kind of issue that resulting in like reduced well-being, uh, causal factors, so all the uh, factors that contribute to the problem and change mechanisms of what makes, makes the change and what uh, creates the impact at the end of that. Um, okay, so we can break it down into tree like this, where we basically have population problem, causal factors, uh, change mechanisms, you can like remember PPCC. Um, so first of all, like you can think about your population, um, let's say people with uh, depression in low and middle income countries, and then you break it down by a problem. Why is, uh, um, basically what is specifically the problem? Is it that they feel depressed and that's not directly great for their well-being? Is it that they're depressed, therefore they cannot work and therefore they cannot you know, uh, provide for their families, and so on and so forth. Kind of what are the practical factors of the problem? Um, do you want to answer, what's your name? Itamar. Sorry? Itamar. Itamar, okay, great. Um, would you like to maybe come up with some um, ideas for uh, causal factors and like possible change mechanisms? Just like very quick ideas. We'll work for that later on. I would say causal factors are the things that cause the depression or things that depression causes? What they, uh, what causes depression and like what causes it to still be a problem? For example, what, why isn't being treated? I'm assuming it's also because the lack of access to mental health healthcare mm -hmm. professionals, uh, poverty, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, 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 all the problems around it, healthcare poverty also isn't helping. Mm -hmm. But it's also, in my opinion, a problem with feed itself. When people are depressed that they're not pushing to get out of the loop that they're in. Um, good, really good. Um, I think basically here, the more, in a way, the more comprehensive picture we have, the more likely that we'll find an intervention that could be like really, really fantastic. So here, uh, this is like brainstorming session, even though it like, looks very structured and everything, this is basically structured brainstorm, where you try to think about all possible problems, reasons, causal factor, like maybe stigma is a factor. Maybe is that, I don't know, women would like to access mental health treatment and they have access to that, but maybe they have too, many, too much on their hands and they actually they never find time for it. So like basically, if more comprehensive picture you have of that, the more likely that you'll find the idea that might be the best one to solve that. Um, okay, so very shortly, population um, is a group of people, not human and animals, recipients of your, recipients of your program. Uh, it could be as narrow or, or broad um, as you can, experiment with different sizes. So it could be all people with depression in the world. It could be people in depression in low-income countries or this specific country, or it could be all fish, or it could be as specific as all fish who are in, who are in the aqua, aquaculture who are in the ponds of a size no longer bigger than 20 meters. Just because you know different population sizes and pond sizes will have different problems related to that and different causal mechanisms. So sometimes it's helpful to break it down to like uh, very specific factors as you go uh, later on. 
about repeat problems. Um, this is again is something that will uh, you can get knowledge about that from academic literature. Uh, what is the cause of the pro problem and uh, understand where it's coming from. You can also, but also what is often needed is just understanding of the facts on the ground. Something might be like theoretically important, but when you go on the ground, that actually might not be the case, or the, the context might be different, so that no longer applies. Um, so it's both important to get knowledge about those sort of things. Um, there's specific tools um, that have been developed in order to assess those needs. I link those here. I'll, you know, you'll, I can share the presentation on the event later on, so you'll have access to all the resources. Uh, so I'll be linking them for the presentation for future to check out, and you can go for the process yourself. So there are specific tools designed to help you do that. Okay, causal factors, um, all the circumstances that are creating that problem. Uh, usually the problem will have multiple causal factors. You as a new organization, especially a startup, very likely will be just focus on, be able to just focus on one. If you as a startup will try to you know, address low awareness about mental health problems and uh, manufacture antidepressants and like do R and D in like new antidepressants that are like cause less side effects and also um, I don't know do early diagnosis in children like there will be so much things to do for a young startup that you might just not make progress and sometimes better to just focus on the uh, factor again think about the, the the distribution most likely some factors are going to be much more important than others and try to find those and focus on those um, especially as a new organization. Um, usually, so it's being uh, illustrated with a tree like that, with branches being consequences, uh, trying being the, the problem that is absurd, and then like root causes that could contribute to, to the problem. Um, again, there are a couple of uh, tools that helps you with that. For example, this question's methodology. You can think about like nature and extent of the main problem. You know. Uh, where it's coming from, what is the historical context around it, uh, what are the causes, um, have there been any problems that have been effective in the past, and so on and so forth. So going through like a checklist like this might help you brainstorm more, more ideas for that. Uh, and finally, change mechanisms. Uh, so this is the thing that is going to disrupt the causal chain, leading from, from problem to a problem. Um, so that could be you know, regulation that let ban lets paint, or iron being added to, to flour that reduces anemia. And in this case, try to be very, very specific. Um, you want to have as few fear of change as possible in a given new context. So for example, let's think about animal welfare. And um, barley chickens are uh, raised for meat in India, have very poor welfare, there's lots of them. Um, there's this problem that have been identified, which is uh, aggression uh, in, in the flock, um, and what could be like causal factors? Well, literature and life experience shows that it's like high stock industry. There's just like so many birds in one place. It's like if you were cramped in like one in one room with like 10 other people, like eventually someone would like piss off other person and it would like be aggressive or something. So the same true is like for other animals that some, some of them just don't deal with like density, stock density is very well. Confinement, like assimilation, improper feeding, all of those like causal factors. And the, um, the kind of idea for change mechanisms is changing the confinement because that seemed to be so much tractable. All you have to do, you don't have to change the nature of the animal, you just have to like give them a little bit more space. And then you can be very, very specific about that. So, you know, what would it be um, increase of 10% or 20%? What would be the most cost effective thing? Um, on, and so on and so forth. So basically here you try to identify specific change mechanisms for each of those things. Um, all right. After you identify initial project ideas, it's let's go into evaluation. Again, I'll very briefly just touch on those things so you can dive deeper later on um, as you go. Okay, so the first step is um, evaluation and choose a project. Start with um, applying the scale, solvability and neglectedness, plus cost frameworks, build theory of change, do some backup and envelope estimates of the impact, and um, test your considerations and choose a project. Um, so very shortly, I already mentioned about the, the framework, so I won't be getting to it. The only thing that is added here is the letter C, which is the cost. So uh, how much it will cost to, for example, solve this problem or address that problem. Um, so a helpful tool that might help here is like just putting it in a spreadsheet. Um, so you can, for example, create like various criteria like scale, um, solvability, neglectedness, and then like rate each of your idea uh, on each of your criteria. Even just from like very shallow research, that just to narrow down from all possible points, uh, option spaces to like a couple ones that you'll dive deeper into. So just having like a big spreadsheet with like all of your ideas rated on those factors might already like get you really, really far. Um, next step is like to be develop theory of change and assess the evidence. Um, so basically theory of change is 
uh, the kind of the change mechanisms and the process. So for example, you start with like a need, uh, you move into uh, an input, output, intermediate outcomes and impact. Uh, the need is what the beneficiary needs. So for example, um, you know, high welfare, more space or um, treatment for depression. Um, input is what you do in order to address that need. So for example, provide um, provide access to easy products, uh, vegan products and plant-based meals, or provide anti antidepressants. Output is like the tangible product. So for example, you know, your recipients have access to medication now, or now people can order vegan food very easily uh, and cheaply. Intermediate outcome is like the change in behavior that has resulted from that. For example, people start taking antidepressant medication, or uh, people start to eat more plant-based product and less animal-based product. And then impact is the ultimate thing that you're aiming at. So prediction and depression and you know, increase animal welfare, less animals being consumed, and so on and so forth. Um, so that kind of like gets you, maps help you map the process and later on not only helps you as you're implementing, but also to assess the evidence. Um, because you can assess the evidence at each step of that chain. Um, very, very briefly on that, um, some evidence are better than others. Um, you know, anecdotal evidence is like, has law less of, um, you know, reliability than, for example, a highly rigorous randomized control trial or systematic review of evidence. So this is basically like the pyramid of evidence, more or less, uh, the sort of things. You start at the top, like for example, hmm, are there any studies, uh, or are there like, is there any literature review or meta-analysis that helps me um, assess what is the effect of antidepressants in, you know, people in, from in a big context? Or uh, are there any studies showing uh, that increases number of available plant-based product, reduces animal consumption. So you try to like look for that evidence. Sometimes you'll find it, and that's great, and then you can you know assess that how reliable that is. But sometimes you will not, um, and then you can move on to like next bottom step as you kind of like go to less, less, less certain certain ways to assess the evidence. Um, of course, the stronger your evidence is going to be, the more robust your view of change is going to be, the more likely you will have the impact. But sometimes, you know, sometimes I mean for solving a very big problem that is, you know, it's not, not, there's not like super rigorous studies about how to go about that, but you're aiming still at that. And like outside, if you, if you solve it, that the impact will be huge still might be a good area to pursue, even if there's like less evidence about that. So it's a little bit of the balancing act here. Um, but generally try to work from, from the top to the bottom when it comes to assessing the evidence. Um, there are just, just, just a couple of examples where you, you where to find this evidence. Um, existing literature, there are a couple of websites that like aggregate uh, research that you can just check out, uh, and I highly recommend those. You know, um, individual studies about individual ideas, there's other organizations that are there. Um, and generally, as I mentioned, try to come from the top to the bottom. All right, here are also specific tools that might be helpful for you, specifically how to build theory of change, specifically how to assess you know, evidence for those sort of things. I think that'll be helpful if you wanna dive into it. Um, and this one I'll just very briefly touch on. Um, this is about making back of the envelope calculation uh, or analyzing cost effectiveness. So again, here you're aiming, what out of all the things I could be doing, what if I put you know, my thousand hours or my thousand dollars, where would I have the biggest social um, impact and the very short principle of that is like you analyze the cost and see how much that will cost and then you analyze what the effect would that be for example based on the scientific evidence about that and then you divide cost by evidence by uh, effectiveness and you get cost effectiveness and you do it for multiple ideas the one that you identify and then you'll have a sense um, which ones seem to be more cost effective um, that's like very in, in short, but I'll, I'll link you more resources about how to do it exactly later on. Um, in short, um, when it comes to measuring effectiveness, I guess any questions, because I want maybe to dip into that, any direction you'd like me to mention about anything about cost effectiveness, I know how to go about estimating effectiveness with metrics or how to estimate the cost, any, idea, any direction I should take it in. Yeah, you basically try to find um, a metric that is going to be the closest toward what you're looking for. So for example, if you are aiming at to reduce depression, they are, for example, sociological tools that evaluate uh, depression, they're like depression scores. 
And then your metric that you're aiming at could be reduce depression score from uh, 7 out of 10 to 2 out of 10. And that's the metric you're aiming at, like percent reduction in depression. Or it could be number of animals spared as a result of like plant-based products being more available. So you try to choose a metric that's going to be the closest to it. And when you're measuring impact, you try to go again along, you, you set your KPIs based on theory of change. So for example, you might think that um, in order to reduce depression by diet rate, it means that I need to treat 100 people or 1,000 people from depression. In order to treat 1,000 people from depression, I need to uh, distribute antidepressant to that many people because only some of them will you know, be cured or something like that. And you basically like have that whole process and then you can just measure KPIs uh, along the step. Like, I sign up my partnership with a health clinic to give them antidepressants so they have it at hand. That's like first step. And then like now they distribute it more so I so more people have access to it and so on and so forth. And like you kind of like can set KPI this and that. Alright. I'll be very happy to answer much more questions in the Q and section about any of those things. Um, and lastly, very similar process that you probably have seen in many startups applies in a non-profit as well, where you basically start with, in this case, empathizing, so thinking about the problem, really like aiming and aligning, making sure that you do want to care, have, you know, have the highest social impact you can, um, and you kind of start with that. But after that, we go through the process of defi defining the problem, um, on ideating, coming up with those ideas, prototyping, building new your program, building your organization, testing your assumptions, and you know, if they don't uh, successfully get tested, then you come back to the previous stuff and all of that to the le to the point where you finally your tests are working out, and then you can implement and scale um, the project. So very similar process applies to NGOs with this small difference that you know it may be for profit space you, uh, revenue is your feedback, use the information that tells you whether you're making progress on on that or not. In the case of charities, you'll have to rely on the impact evaluation, on tracking your metrics, and all of that, which is a little bit more work in that way, but, uh, um, but can be done very, very well and reliably. Um, okay, so that I want to run through very quickly uh, for those steps. As I mentioned, there'll be more, there'll be more resources that I'll link to that you can dive deeper into. Um, and lastly, maybe you think that it's quite a lot of work, and it's not that easy, and maybe you think that it's like it requires lots of expertise, and I think it's, it's possible to come up with really good ideas and I think there have been so many people that, you know, came up, through the, went through some of the process and like started absolutely fantastic organizations, like the best organization in the world and there are many examples of those. But sometimes this is just like not something that you're interested in, like maybe you're not, you know, interested in like diving into literature reviews or anything, all of those things, and instead of you're interested in building things and like running things. In that case, uh, you can just select an idea from like a recommended list. So, People, organization last charity entrepreneurship, and many people in the effective altruism space space are working full time on finding those ideas in various cause areas. So, for example, global health and poverty, a couple of ideas, um, road traffic safety, congrats, um, aid quality advocacy, tobacco taxation, postpartum family planning. Those are the four ideas charity entrepreneurship have on our list, and I would love, to, we would love to incubate that. So, if you're interested in any of those ideas, definitely let me know. Um, combined local community based management of acute malnutrition and civilian screening and treatment during pregnancy. This is the sort of ideas that uh, give well the research I came up with. Give well is like the uh, stand up uh, charity evaluator in the space. So those are like ready made ideas that you can take and, and start implementing as an organization. Uh, in animal welfare advocacy, um, ideas we and Animal Ask, which is a research organization in animal space, um, have identified that are particularly promising is fish welfare in Asia including juvenile fish, just because there's literally no organization working on their, implement their, in their welfare production, and bad import on welfare goods. Sometimes countries like Israel has like pretty good annual welfare laws uh, compared to other countries, but maybe they're, they might be ex importing countries, uh, products from countries that have like much lower welfare standards. So just requiring that the import products are the same welfare standards as, as the home meat products uh, could be very, very impactful. Uh, that's, a, that's a weird one, pet snake food, uh, improving rodent welfare, speaking about neglectedness. Um, sometimes you can have really high impact on like, obscure ideas. Basically, there's lots of snakes that people have as pets, and those snakes eat, eat rodents, and there is a lot of them. Um, and they don't live good lives. Um, okay, building and coordinating animal welfare groups. This is basically doing like what, uh, what EA Israel is doing, but for animal welfare groups globally, where, where currently there's little work being done on them. 
Um, band light bait, you know, people use fishing is fine, but sometimes people use like live um, live animals on that, and that's like a huge problem in scale, and no one's working on that, and it's quite solvable. Um, policy prone to improve compliance with existing animal welfare for loss, um, chicken welfare in Asia, and lastly, insect intervention. So there could be like things that we have uh, we're very excited about. Um, alternative protein, the leader here is Good Food Institute, and that is working on alternative protein space, a couple of ideas from their list, scientists, engineer outreach and education, plant-based and cultivated protein market space, uh, database and facility engineering, all of those things. I know that there's quite a lot of startups in Israel specifically working on alternative protein, so I think that's like starting to be quite thriving and to be all community here. So GFI is like a global go-to uh, research and, and organization for that. And, and lastly, biosecurity. Uh, a couple of organizations working in that space, uh, things like early detection centers to you know catch COVID before it was a big problem and prevent it from happening, designing better uh, personal protective equipment, medical countermeasures, you know uh, vaccines, antimicrobials, those things, um, clean water, sanitation, and low income countries, uh, various other ideas are all on the list of uh, ideas for biosecurity that could be very very impactful and there's big support for. Um, and lastly, mental health, and uh, that has relatively less ideas, very under research space. Uh, graded self help, I already mentioned about, um, and just broad areas mental health in low income countries, something here, we don't know what. Pain, something here, we don't know. <laughs> Headaches, for example, are as big a global problem as malaria is, and there's not that much progress ha that have been happened um, in treatment of headaches or, or, or serious pain. Um, so I think the research and innovation space is very much needed. As you can see, this is comparably short and very underspecified, and there's not that many organizations that work on the problem. Um, all right, what is the success rate of a startup, for profit startup or startups in like that you are aware of? One to ten. One to ten. Three to five. Three to five. Three to five. Anyone else? Five. Five percent. Okay. Um, you know, decent. It's like, you know, it, it's working. Um, among the charities we incubated, uh, we see success rate of uh, 50%. Um, almost, yeah, base or even a little bit more. So two out of five charities are exceeding cost effectiveness of the strongest charities in the field, becoming like field experts, like top charities in their areas. Two out of five remain small or are before scale up and have a little bit unclear cost effectiveness, but are considered like good charities and like much better than the you know, average charities. Um, and one of five shutdowns within, within 25 months without having significant impact. So uh, four out of five per year of the charities we incubate uh, are doing pretty good, with some being like doing really, really, like being the unicorn equivalent of the charitable space. Um, and that's something that uh, we've seen constantly across all the years. And now our goal is to increase that uh, and double the quality. So make all four, four out of five like the very top charities and make all the charities we've made to be the best charity in their field. That's the goal for the next three years. So wish us luck yeah. or join us to help us out. But I feel with, with track record, we have, a, we have a decent shot at it. Um, all right, so a little bit more about CE. If you're interested, you can check out our website. Uh, we are always looking for people who wants to incubate in your organization. As I mentioned, we have the charitable ideas, we have the seed funding, uh, we have the training and anything else that people might need to start a charity. Um, and all, all the only thing we need is, is the people who want to take those ideas and start new organizations in the space. And we'll do everything to, to support you on the journey and make you one of those successful charities that come out of it. Um, so in short, structure of the program, the first month is focusing on co-founder pairing, on training with any all the basics and choosing an idea. And uh, second month is uh, for starting to build your charity, like narrowing down the intervention, exploring countries to work in, um, and applying for seed funding. Uh, basically, um, application for seed funding is handing us a project proposal that you do at the end of the program. And once you are in the program, there are about like 80-90% of chance of like getting a seed grant. So almost everyone receives a seed grant at the end because we, we find the best people and we have good ideas. That, so that, that pair works always very, very well. So that's in short the, uh, what the program's about. And lastly, uh, we have a lovely community. I think there's if there's something that I absolutely love about it and like what me, makes me always say that I think like, even though I'm like 26, I think I'm find my job that I'm gonna be in like forever is the lovely community of people 
and you know, like entrepreneurs, that, that's pretty great. And like entrepreneurs that care about others, that could be greater. Uh, so I just think like I absolutely love those people. Uh, so yeah, we have like people who went through incubation program from literally all around, all around the world. This year we got incubation, uh, we got application from like 80, 90 countries. Um, so there's quite big interests uh, across the globe, um, but only a couple of people are really fantastic fit to, to be those co-founders. So if you think you might be one of those people, uh, absolutely let me know. Uh, my email is carolina at charityentrepreneurship.com. I hope I didn't misspell that. Uh, <laughs> so you can reach out to me anytime and you can also check us, um, check us and see how we approach those things. Also on our website, you'll find all our research process written up in details from all years. So you can just look at it and see, follow it for whatever area you're interested in as well, um, and find other helpful information, like for example, a handbook about starting new new charities and how does it differ in like for-profit space versus non-profit space, and how can you maximize your impact as a as a charity. So all of that to be found there. And thank you very much. Then I really look forward to being here. Favorite part, always. So I look forward to the questions, but I'll end up the mic. Yeah, so we're gonna have a short QA and then you guys can ask more questions during the mingling event. So maybe we'll let three questions. Um, so I guess raise your hands or, or ask a question. Okay, so that's um, <coughs> this is gonna be a problem. We'll take four and that'll be that. So going from left to right. Basically, I'm a night owl, so I'll stay up late. So you can ask me questions afterwards. Well. Yes. Hi. What is the to you between uh, like uh, charity infrastructure from uh, like uh, a big organization who will try also to solve the problem like uh, probably as uh, the UN uh, different organizations and, and other like startup and pieces that try to solve also problems. Uh, yeah. So, so I think like analogy is quite similar to like for-profit space. So one could say like, oh yeah, maybe like Facebook is serving like all technological needs. So why do we need more technological startups? But like obviously we do um, new need organization, new innovation, new startups in space that are not filling the needs that are being filled. And I think um, big organizations and institutions sometimes are just not equipped to even see those problems. So you know those organizations, like UN, HWO, have been existing for decades now, and yet you know lead paint still haven't been regulated in majority of the countries in the world. So there are some factors that stop them from from doing anything in the space. And sometimes that the problem is neglected. Sometimes they have other priorities, um, or that just like you know not a sexy area to work in, um, like you know rodent welfare. Um, so there's like maybe less people that are interested in that. So I think like the difference between big institutions and us is that um, we might be more agile and faster react to the opportunities that we find in this space. It will take forever for like big organization to launch a project. Um, and trust me, I worked with big foundations and NGOs uh, on kind of impact consulting, whatever calm, help them choose a program idea, and it was just absolute nightmare. Even if they wanted to change, it would take forever. Uh, to do it so so often like in your organization that can be faster and agile and address that and that need is still very needed even though there were big organizations addressing similar problems. So yeah um, that's you. Okay, my name is Shaha and you spoke about many core areas but you haven't mentioned a climate, mm -hmm. energy, pollution, and also mm -hmm. existential crisis. Many kinds of those other than the uh, biohazard that you talked about. And I wonder uh, why uh, don't you, is just in this presentation you haven't shown them, or in general in charity anthropology, anthropology we don't work on these core areas, and if so, why? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll be very happy to dive into all of those that you mentioned. I've, I've been given 45 minutes and I probably already passed that, so <laughs> probably I wouldn't have the time to cover everything. So I selected the areas that we think are like most promising to work on um, and uh, causes that we actively support. Um, so that's kind of why I try to narrow it down uh, because of that. Um, but in terms of like other cause areas, there are other organizations working on with climate change, even though it's a big problem and it's potentially uh, tractable and solvable, uh, it's not neglected. It's not a problem that, uh, you know, there's already a problem that lots of people are working on. It's a big mobilization. And of course, we are making way too slow progress, but it's still amount of resources and human attention that goes to that problem is really, really large compared to some other problems that might be also very big in scale, but don't have organizations working on that. So that's like the reason why climate change haven't been prioritized uh, by us. 
with existential risks, I depend, uh, that depends on a specific idea here, um, but I feel like there are some challenges to um, even knowing what's going to work in the long term uh, about those sort of things. So I feel like the uh, amount of evidence or feedback loops or search and view can have that you're actually solving that problem um, is much lower. Um, and I think that's the problem with the kind of tractability, solvability question, um, and that currently we don't have ways of reliably reduce that. Um, so if, you know, in the future more research will come up, more information about that, then I think like, you know, that might be potentially, depending on which exact subset of it, could be promising. But like biosecurity, for example, is being considered as like, you know, existential risk cost, and, and that's something that uh, is much more um, conducive to like new organization working in the space, and also uh, we know we are able to measure, and like observe, even not measure, but even project the potential impact that's going to have. Uh, so we are actually able to assess those things and, and reliably work toward those. I'm happy to dive deeper into that um, in the later on during England as well, just because you know, probably I could talk for hours specifically about that, so happy to do so. Yeah, we have some time constraints, so we can take one more question. Um, yeah, it was from the beginning, so. Uh, I had a question. When you're talking about predict cost effectiveness, what kind of scale are you measuring? For example, if you're trying to buy a hand that you have for people in Uganda, so if you're distributed to 10,000 people to start the operation, per person that would be a lot more Great, great, great question. Um, yeah, so when we are modeling as a startup incubator, when we are evaluating the cost effectiveness, we look at the initial setup cost, so how much, what would be the upfront cost of starting our in the space, just because different areas will, you know, a policy organization or a mass media organization might need more upfront cost than like a small agile organization, like direct delivery of fortifying flour or something. So we uh, estimate the, the setup cost and then we estimate the marginal cost what would be the cost of treating additional person um, or something like that. And then we look at the setup cost plus the expected marginal cost per, um, per additional beneficiary and then we evaluate the scale of the organization and that way we kind of have the ballpark estimate of potential cost effectiveness. All right, thank you very much, Carol.